Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week, we are going to be talking to Adam Gopnik from The New Yorker about his latest book, The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery, in which Adam decides to try and master some stuff kind of late in life, takes a drawing class after being an art critic for many years, and he also decided to get his driver's license at the age of 55. He's also going to talk about what it was like watching Master of Acting Kate Blanchett on the set of the Oscar-nominated film Tar, in which Adam was also featured. Then we're going to get some comedy from the very funny Abby Govindin, who somehow managed to scam the KKK for a college project that she was doing. And finally, we'll get some music from Reckless Son, who has performed over 150 concerts in jails and prisons across the country. And now he'll be on Livewire, which gets started right after this. Listen to Grown, a new podcast from The Moth for true stories that deal with the challenges and joys of growing up. Co-hosts Elisa Cosme and Alfonso Lacayo are on the cusp of adulthood, and they're bringing you moth stories about first crushes, culture, identity, secrets, and more. Each episode, they'll dissect these stories, talk to the storytellers themselves, and feature on-the-street interviews, audio diaries from young voices, and more. Grown is a podcast that reminds us that no matter how old we are, we're never fully grown. New episodes drop bi-weekly on Fridays beginning Wednesday, February 8th. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey there, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going pretty well this week. Are you ready for another round of station location identification examination? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, this is where I'm going to quiz you on somewhere in the country your live wires on the radio. You've got to guess the place I am talking about. And I want to mention, no pressure, but I was able to guess this one before they provided me with the answer. Oh, this means I'm not going to get it. <laughs> because of one of the specific clues. So we'll get okay. to it. This city is home to the world's largest ball of stamps, which is located in the Boys Town Stamp Center. Uh, it's 600 pounds. It measures 32 inches in diameter and contains more than 4.6 million canceled stamps. Is this the clue that you got? No, it's not. I'm I'm starting with the with I think the the less illuminating clue. I think big balls of stamps read very Midwest to me. Yes, yes, you are in the right part of the country. But I don't know the city. <laughs> okay, Johnny Carson got his start in this city on the local TV station. He had a show called. The Squirrel's Nest. Weird, wild stuff. Is it Omaha, Nebraska? It is Omaha, <laughs> Nebraska, Elena, where we are on KIOS Radio. Famous Nebraskan, Johnny Carson. That was the clue that uh, led me to the answer as well. Weird, wild stamps. <laughs> <laughs> Some weird, wild stamps. <laughs> That's a much better Carson than I was doing. All right, should we get rolling with the show? Let's do it. All right, take it away. From PRX, it's... This week, New Yorker writer Adam Gopnik. Todd Field, the director and the writer, a wonderful guy, called me out of the blue and said, I've written a movie for Kate Blanchett, and there's a character in it named Adam Gopnik. Would you consider playing him? And comedian Abby Govindan. Translated from Sanskrit, Govindan means shepherd, and Abhinaya means overdramatic. So essentially, I am Jesus. Thank you. With music from Reckless Sun and our fabulous house band. I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now, the host of Livewire, Luke Burbank. Thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks for tuning in from all over these United States. Uh, we got a great show in store for you this week. Uh, of course, we asked LiveWire listeners a question. We asked, what are you the master of? Mm -hmm. This is related to Adam Gopnik's latest book. We're going to hear those answers coming up in a minute. First, though, it is time for the best news we heard all week. This is our little reminder at the top of the show. There is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news you heard all week? Okay, um... Uh, sort of stretching maybe best. The best okay. news is everybody's okay. 
All right. <laughs> Everybody in it. the story is okay. This is, takes place in South Africa, where at the beginning of the month, a 30-year-old pilot for an engineering company named Rudolf Erasmus was flying four passengers in his little plane across South Africa. And he feels something off, like this weird kind of breeze feeling. And he's like, what's happening? And he thought maybe his water bottle had spilled or something. He just feels this kind of weird tickle. And he looks down and there is a four foot cape cobra (gasps) circled around his feet in the cockpit. Yeah. And uh, I went ahead and did some Wikipedia-ing because I was like, oh, maybe it's one of those garter snake cobras that you never hear about. Like maybe <laughs> right. I've just been that like- maybe exist. Nope, well, wrong. The Cape Cobra is uh, one of the two deadliest snakes in that region. It's also known as the Yellow Cobra. It's highly venomous. According to Wikipedia, it's quick moving and an alert species. <laughs> so Rudolf Rasmus had this deadly nope rope, which is what my brother calls snakes. <laughs> <laughs> As in nope, I don't want to mess with that rope. Yep, exactly. At his feet. And he was worried that the snake was going to obviously bite him or slither back and bite some of the passengers. So he very calmly got on the intercom and said, hey, guys, there's snakes on this plane. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And they, uh, the whole plane just fell deadly silent. It took 10 minutes to find a place to land. And they did. And he got out of there and he was standing on the wing and he looked through the window. He pulled his seat back and the cobra was just curled into, he says, uh, a nice little bundle underneath my seat. (laughs) The good news is everybody got out. That pilot has nerves of steel. And here's the interesting thing. Once they got on the ground, they called a reptile guy and they couldn't find the snake. (laughs) No. This is like the much more scary version of something that happened at my house where I had a a garner snake, but I wanted to videotape it on my phone and then it got into my like HVAC and it's still never been seen. The stakes much lower in that situation, though, I'd like to point out. The snakes were also much lower because that story happened on the ground. (laughs) Exactly. This was at what, 30,000 feet? Oh my gosh. Two things that could end your life real fast, a plane crash or a venomous snake bite. And these were both intersecting in the skies above South Africa. Uh, It's a potential twofer right there. And the poor uh, Rudolph Erasmus had to fly the same plane home afterward. So so he just plugged up all the holes of his plane as best he could and tootled on home. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of things that went missing, the best news that I saw this week is about something that's been missing in Arizona, but has recently been found. And it is a 15-foot-tall red spoon from a Dairy Queen in the greater Phoenix area. So this was, like, bolted to the side of a Dairy Queen owned by uh, Rahman and Pooja Kalra. They own a number of Dairy Queens in the area. And one day they showed up for work and were surprised to see that the 15-foot red spoon was no longer attached to their Dairy Queen. They looked at the surveillance video and... Three people had pulled up, unbolted the spoon, and then put it on like a trailer on a flatbed truck and took it out of there. Now, it turns out replacing the spoon was going to cost like (laughs) $7,000. So they were really hoping to get it back. They, you know, it was on the local media. They even made T-shirts for their employees that said, where's my spoon? (laughs) So everybody was, everybody was on the lookout for this huge spoon and it was uh, it was nowhere to be found until a guy named Michael Foster, he's 52 years old, uh, he was out pretty early in the morning. It was like 7 a.m. in the morning. And Elena, guess what he was doing? Uh, rollerblading. Close. He was playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> and he was trying to capture some kind of Pokemon that was at a middle school in in Phoenix, and I don't know if he got the Pokemon or not, but what he did see was a 15-foot red spoon, which he, I think, rightfully assumed was the spoon everyone was looking for. And in fact, he says what he did initially was he immediately texted his wife and said, it's the spoon. He sent her a picture. Aww. And her response was just, call the police. <laughs> so he did... Called the police. They came out of the custodial staff from the middle school had to help push the spoon over the fence because it was really heavy. Then the police strapped 
the spoon to the top of the cruiser. <laughs> Yes. And drove it back to the Dairy Queen where it has now, I think, been reattached. The best part is that the couple that owns Dairy Queen had promised free blizzards for anyone <gasps> who helped with the with the return of the spoon. So it sounds like Michael Foster and his whole family and probably the custodial staff from the school, even maybe the police officer, everyone's in for a free blizzard. <laughs> that is the best news that I saw this week. Okay, let's invite our first guest on over. He's been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1986. He's also a New York Times bestselling author who's published many books, including the bestseller Paris to the Moon. His latest book, The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery, explores the fundamental question of how do we learn and master a new skill. He also recently appeared in the Oscar-nominated film Tar, starring Kate Blanchett. Uh, where he appears in a role that they specifically wrote for him. The character was named Adam Gopnik. Here he is, Adam Gopnik on Livewire. Hello, Adam. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed this book. Um, can you talk about what the real work actually means? It's like a magician's term? Sure, yeah. I learned this term from magicians when my son, Luke, Luke, was, was about... This is one of those Luke, I'm not your father <laughs> yes, exactly, situations. Yes, exactly. In that case, I am his father, yeah, right? That and, one, and, 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 um, when he was about 13, he got obsessed with card magic, which many 13-year-old boys do. But he got really quite good at it, and we ended up going off to Las Vegas with his teacher, a wonderful magician named Jamie Ian Swiss. And we spent a lot of time among magicians. And what I noticed is magicians have the most wonderful shop talk of any human being. Shop talk is the best kind of talk there is, but writer, writers don't really have shop talk because all we can talk about is advances and <laughs> book tours. That's the only thing that ever happens to writers. But magicians have fantastic shop talk because they can only talk with each other, right? Because they can never tell a civilian what it is that they're doing. And the phrase that kept coming back again and again at 3 a.m. in a diner in Las Vegas was the real work. Who's got the real work on that? Does he have the real work on that? She's got the real work on that? And what they meant by it, I realized after a time, was not who invented the trick or the illusion, not even who had perfected it, but who did it in the most credible and spontaneous and persuasive way. And that's the person who had the real work. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I heard that term, I said, oh my goodness, because we all know what the real work is in the field that we're a master of. We know instantly who's got the real work on anything. And I was at a stage in life where I was doing a lot of compensatory work you know, wanting to study things that I had missed somehow or failed to do. And so I realized I was in pursuit of the real work. Uh, you, after being an art critic for many years, you started taking a drawing class, which feels like the punchline kind of writes itself. Like, yes. you know, after critiquing so many other people for so long, you then tried to put sort of pen or pencil to paper. How did that go for you? Um, very badly. I was probably the <laughs> single most unskilled draftsman in, since the Renaissance. In fact, I think they wanted to cancel the Renaissance once they saw <laughs> what I made of a uh, drawing. But it was, it was, you know, useful for me. Now, you can make the case that you don't have to be a skilled drawer to judge art, but I think it's generally true that if we don't have some basic empathetic understanding of the enterprise that we're talking about, that we're criticizing or judging, you, none of us will ever be able to hit a 100-mile-per-hour fastball. But if we've swung at a 40-mile-per-hour fastball, <laughs> we have some vague general idea of what that task is, how difficult it is and what the skills are you need. So I studied drawing, looked at a lot of naked people who come into the room and, and stumble to get them right. I don't want to give too much away from the book, but there is a memorable moment where a, a naked person you've just drawn <laughs> comes over and observes yes. how the drawing's going. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which seems like it'd be a lot of pressure on you. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was immense pressure because she was about four feet tall, you know, and I had done this, this magnificent, terrible drawing of her at the time, and she came over with a heavy New York accent. She said, is that me? Right? And the... And, the, and I assume she was the only nude person yeah. in the room. Right. right? right. So the fact that she had to ask. Yes, exactly. If it was but, her. You know, the, what was so cool, though, about learning to draw is that you don't learn to draw 
by um, looking at something and then saying, oh, I'm going to get it down right, because that's totally numbing and totally paralyzing. What you learn to do is all these tiny little steps and stunts. Mm -hmm. So my drawing teacher, great, totally reactionary guy who thinks that art's been on taking the wrong course since 1855, basically hates all art <laughs> <laughs> since 1855, Cezanne, Van Gogh, whoever, d doesn't, you know, thinks they're all on the wrong track. But what he taught me was that the way you draw a face is not to attempt to draw the face, but just to imagine the face as a clock face. And you see the way you tilted your head right now, Luther? This is a great radio moment, right, yes. when I say... It's a highly <laughs> visual medium, yes. I believe. You, we see the way yeah. you just tilted your yeah. head. But you did just tilt your head. Yeah. And you tilted it right at 1 o'clock. You see, so if I draw a, a clock face on you, I can get the tilt of your head right at 1 o'clock. And I spent weeks just doing tilts in time. And just those little crude schematic steps over time turn into the seamless illusion of uh, a drawing, of a better drawing, if not actually a good drawing. And if there was a continuity in everything I did, you know, I learned to drive and I learned to dance and I learned to box. Uh, and what all those things have in common is, is that you learn these horribly embarrassing, stumbling little steps. And just through sheer perseverance, they begin to turn into the illusion of a seamless sequence. And that's hmm. invariably the nature of the real work. Uh, this is Livewire Radio coming to you this week from Town Hall in Seattle, Washington. We are talking to Adam Gopnik about his latest book, The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery. Uh, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to find out more about, like, maybe sort of the world's first AI program, or at least what was billed as some yes. kind of a, a chess-playing robot Absolutely. called the Turk, the Turk, which is detailed in the book. Uh, more with Adam Gopnik in just a moment, here on Livewire. Hello there, Livewire listeners. It's Luke, letting you know that we have officially kicked off our spring member drive, and over the next two weeks, we are aiming to sign up 50 new members to the League of Extraordinary Listeners. Uh, you may know this, you may not, but Livewire is an independently produced radio show, and we rely very much on the support of our sustaining members. And in exchange for your monthly donation and the overall good feeling you'll get of keeping us on the air, we also offer lots of fun perks. We're not asking you to do this purely out of altruism. We'll give you an on-air shout-out, exclusive content, fanny packs. Yes, that's right. A limited edition Livewire fanny pack could be yours if you become one of our 50 new members. You can do that over at livewireradio.org today. And thank you. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We are at Town Hall in Seattle this week. Very exciting. And we are talking to Adam Gopnik from The New Yorker and also his latest book, The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery. Um, one of the stories that you tell in this book is of this chess playing a machine called Robot, the Turk? Robot, automaton. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is in the 18th century. Um, a magician, really, built this machine that seemed, it was dressed in Ottoman garb, and it was brilliantly designed, so it seemed to be a robot playing chess. They didn't have the word robot. They called it an automaton. And it defeated Napoleon and Ben Franklin and every celebrity of that time and great chess masters. And nobody knew how it worked. They figured it's a machine that plays chess. Now, if they had been thinking 
clearly, as none of us ever do, they would have said, well, if there's a machine to play chess, there should have been a machine to play checkers before it, right? It's kind of come out of the blue, this machine. <laughs> and of course, it wasn't a machine. It was an illusion. There was a chess player buried inside the, the chest at the bottom of it that was manipulating the pieces. But they would like open the cabinet and, and show be, these yes, like, gears. Exactly. And the chess player would be on the kind of a, uh, you know, a springboard and he would come back up and then he would slide back down and all of it. Here's the fascinating thing about it to me. Everybody speculated, including Edgar Allan Poe, if you can imagine, how was it that this thing worked? Because they said, it has to be this insanely great, tiny chess master, a child who's been <laughs> drugged for life, right? Or a little person who's been enslaved to do it. Here's how it worked. The magician, whose name was Von Kemplin, would go from town to town, come to uh, Philadelphia or Boston or Paris, and he'd go to a chess cafe, and he would say, is there anybody here who needs a gig and doesn't mind very close working conditions? <laughs> and in each town he went to, he found a strong enough chess player who, once you put him in this very, very impressive garb, suddenly became a great chess player. Mm. Because it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz, right? It's the little man behind the curtain. We are impressed by the atmospherics of things as much as we are impressed by the efficacy of someone doing it. And so a mediocre or a good chess player became a great chess player in the garb of the Ottoman. Mm. Basic lesson there. And the other thing, too, that you point out with that story is there are a lot of people who are like, pretty good at stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Like, he could find chess players, enough of them, to really wow people. Absolutely. That's one of the truths about modern life, is that we have a plurality of masters, which raises the question, what is it that uh, distinguishes the people who we think of as being uniquely good mm -hmm. at doing something? And invariably, it's not just that they have a level of technical virtuosity, it's that they have some, they've discovered some form of personal, human way of uh, vibrating, of altering the technical virtuosity to give it a uniquely human signature. Jimi Hendrix, child of the city we're sitting in, we love Jimi Hendrix not just because he's technically amazing, but because of the distortion in his guitar playing because of the way he found a whole new realm of sound to play with. That's what distinguishes a very good guitar player from a uniquely great guitar player. Well, speaking of recognized masters, uh, the actor Kate Blanchett mm -hmm. is in this movie Tar that's yes. nominated for an Academy Award. I think of it really as an Adam Gopnik picture. Absolutely. Um, because you are <laughs> basically so the first 15 <laughs> minutes of the film. It's incredible. I mean, uh, how did that come about? And uh, was that uh, uh, really nervous making for you to be on this set with so, somebody like so Kate Blanchett? So Todd Field, the director and the writer, a uh, wonderful guy, called me out of the blue and said, I've written a movie for Kate Blanchett and there's a character in it named Adam Gopnik. Would you consider playing him? <laughs> At first, I said, you know, I'm a writer, and I'm a serious intellectual, and I'm concerned with, you know, with the crisis of incarceration and the national emergency of Trump, and I don't do things like that. And he said, that's such a shame, because Kate was so looking forward to working with you, and will be so disappointed if you're not there. And I said, hold on, let me call Mr. Gopnik to the phone. <laughs> and off we went to Berlin. Uh, to do it, and we spent two days doing it. Kate, my friend Kate, yeah. <laughs> actress Kate, and I uh, did this. Well, talk about mastery. Did, were you working on the book project while you were working yes, with Kate Yes, and, and, and truly, it was one of the things that drew me to do it, was because I thought, this will be really interesting to work with a, a master actor like Kate Blanchett. But what was most amazing about her was her professionalism, which I know sounds like a minimal way, form of praise. What else would she be except professional? But by that, I mean that she had found psychological motivation in every line of that very, what could have been an extremely tedious, what may have been, in fact, <laughs> an extremely tedious scene otherwise. She had found a, a way into it, and she always found a little variation on it, but never departed from the, the path that she had chosen. And it was amazing. It was like playing tennis with somebody um, who's a master tennis player and keeps hitting the ball just over the net in a way that you can handle. So she could be consistent take after take after, after take after take, take, exactly. which makes it easier to make a movie out of this thing that she's sort of pulling out of herself. Exactly. And they had to remind me that once I'd done an improv that was successful, they could keep it, but they couldn't. I couldn't change it shot after shot as we worked it over for two days. And in fact, the audience, though it was supposed to be in New York, was made entirely of Germans, Berliners, German speakers. And there had to be a German assistant director who would tell them when to laugh at my jokes. 
and I would Maybe hear him saying, Once, you know, in, <laughs> <laughs> something going on. If Germany is the best place for a comedian to work, actually, because they have assistant directors who enforce laughter <laughs> <laughs> at every turn. <laughs> um, you also, in, in, in this book, uh, decided you wanted to get your driver's license. And how old were you when you got it? I was 55 when I got my driver's license. Only in, thank you, only in New York can you survive that long without knowing how to drive. But I believe that I am distinguished. I believe I am the only person who ever got his driver's license on the same day, the same afternoon, as his 20-year-old son. <laughs> I went into the car and did the test. Then I got out. Luke got into the car and, and did the test. We both passed. They passed him because he could drive. I think they passed me as a kind of experimental joke. What will happen <laughs> if we allow this guy out on the streets, and what, you know, what will be the final result? I th I'm sure they're still laughing about it at the Department of Motor Vehicles. You know what I actually I found so charming about that part of the book was that you, upon getting your license, called your dad. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, my dad, one of the themes of the book, if I can be serious for a moment, is that all of the things we learn to do are never about technique. They're always about another person. I have a chapter about learning to bake, and it's about my relationship with my mother. The chapter about learning to drive is about my relationship with my super competent father. Mm. And we all make ourselves in the shadow of our fathers, but also searching for sunlight that they don't eclipse. And my father was super competent, and that was one of the reasons I had never, I had never learned to drive. I had spent my entire marriage in what was traditionally gendered as the woman's seat. You know, I was the one who was always saying to the kids, just shh, be quiet, your mom needs to find the exit. You know, right. please, can we, let's just keep it down for one second while your mom, your mom is focusing. And I ended up doing it, but I had a great teacher. Of, you know, the book is very much about great teachers. Like, and there was never a better teacher than Arturo Leon, who was my driving teacher, because he taught me the single most important thing in driving, which is the hand. And he said, whenever you're likely to be in any kind of conflict with another car, he said, just use the hand. Just hold up, use the hand. He said, because the hand means everything. He mm -hmm. said, the hand means f you, the hand means bless you, the hand means thank you, the hand means wait a moment, the hand means I'm exiting, the hand means I'm entering. Just use the hand at every time. And I have been using the hand ever since. <laughs> have you brought it into other parts of your life? <laughs> the like hand will work for everything. Going yes. to the airport, wherever you are, just like... Exactly. It's sort of, you're right, I mean, it's, it's, you're not taking any more crap from this person, but you're also not giving them like, right. something that's openly aggressive no, or hostile. They can interpret it as broadly as they want to, right? And that's it. <laughs> and Artura's point, which is a good one, is that the reason, the thing I learned about driving is that it's actually not that difficult even if you're 55 when you well, start? except for the fact that he apparently picked you up in front of your house in Manhattan. Yeah. And was like, get in, and that was your beginning of driving? I was paralyzed with fear as I went up Madison Avenue with taxis honking and 16-wheelers <laughs> surrounding me. But that's the thing about driving. It's not really that difficult. It's just incredibly dangerous. <laughs> if you learn to do it when you're 15, you don't understand danger as a concept. Right. Because you're immortal and nothing will ever happen to you. If you're 55, all you can think about is, I've got three tons of metal at my command and no one is stopping me <laughs> from plowing into the next car, from running through the light. And it's, it's terrifying. I mean, if, they, if anyone looked rationally at what driving is, we would never allow anyone to drive. Yeah. Uh, we're talking to Adam Gopnik here on Livewire about his new book, The Real Work, on the mystery of mastery. That's a typical reaction in Seattle when you mention the end of cars. Oh, yes, it's That's uniquely. <laughs> most of the people recumbent biked here <laughs> on the Burke Gilman Trail. Um, this book uh, really took an unexpected turn for me sort of towards the end uh, after, you know, you're talking about learning to drive and, and do all these things that you wanted to sort of master. And a thing that you also decided you wanted to master or at least improve on was the ability to pee on an airplane. Yes. I suffer from a condition, which I suspect somebody else in this room does, if the statistics are right, of extreme shy bladder, which is called periuresis. It has a medical name, periuresis. And it sounds like the most, it is the most embarrassing uh, condition you can possibly have. You can't urinate uh, in public places and certainly not on planes. But it exacts an enormous price, because if you think about it, if you're on a seven or eight hour flight and you're in extreme discomfort for most of the flight, 
And it's one of those things that's simultaneously trivial and embarrassing and very life dominating for anybody who suffers from it. It's one of those things like insomnia or claustrophobia or something that is only as trivial as it is unless you've got it. Uh, and I went to work with a cognitive behavioral therapist, a wonderful guy named Dan Rocker, who does nothing except treat guys with periuresis. I won't repeat how he describes his daily work. It's in the book. It's, worth, it's in the book. It's <laughs> worth purchasing the book for. <laughs> but that's what he does. He, because the answer to periuresis, as with most phobias and, that we suffer from, is just to practice your way out of it just to mm -hmm. practice your way out of it. And I set about doing that. The funny thing that happened is, is that Dan, bless him, a wonderful guy, is a fanatic bicyclist. He loves, as, like, as here, loves biking through New York, and he encouraged me to get on my bike and follow him to all of these public bathrooms where we would practice <laughs> urinating in public. Now, here's the difficult thing, right? It's actually not at all dangerous to pee in any public place. It is incredibly dangerous to bicycle in New York City. Right. <laughs> So he got me out of one phobia, which was painful, but not in fact dangerous, by encouraging me to pursue an activity which is not painful, but is insanely dangerous <laughs> to be doing, because there are monuments to fallen bicyclists all around New York, right? Yeah. There are no statues to guys who couldn't pee on planes, but... I, I have to say, like, I really appreciated you uh, being vulnerable enough to write about this, because the, I think, and you sort of say this in the chapter, the term shy bladder in a way, it, it diminishes it or makes it seem like, hey, why are you being so shy? But I mean, it's, a, it's on the same sort of continuum as a sort of a small panic attack, right? Yeah, it, is, it is a form of a small, small daily panic attack in one, in one little room. Uh, <laughs> you know, the truth of it is, and this is something that you, I wanted to draw attention to, of course it was difficult and embarrassing and, and I was at some moment reluctant to do it. Everybody's got something. Every single person in this room and in any room you turn into mm -hmm. is struggling with something. And that's part of our common humanity. We struggle with our phobias. We struggle with our anxieties. <laughs> and it's sort of the reverse of the, of the accomplishments I'm talking about. You build accomplishments and skills out of all of these tiny little steps. And then somehow in life we do the reverse. We build things that imprison us and limit us out of some tiny steps that we don't even remember mm. from our childhood. And then we have to disassemble them so that we can enter more fully into, into concert with other people. And I just think that that's the single most important thing you can learn. You build up the real work through little steps, and you disassemble the bad work through the same kinds of little steps. That's what, that's the task that's before all of us in life. Yeah. The book is The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery, written by the star of the movie Tar, Adam <laughs> Gopnik. <laughs> That was Adam Gopnik right here on Livewire. His latest book, The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery, is available now. Hey, special thanks this week to Katrina Penafleur of Portland, Oregon. Katrina is part of the Livewire member community and is generously supporting the show with a donation each month, which is a really big deal to us because it's how we're able to keep doing Livewire. So a big, big thanks to Katrina for keeping the show going. This is Livewire from PRX. Of course, each week we ask our listeners a question uh, based on Adam Gopnik's book. This week we ask the listeners, what are you a master of? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? Uh, here's one from Zara. Zara is the master of making playlists for very niche moods. Okay. <laughs> yes, because you know, like, I feel like our whole culture now is subject to like perennial scrolling. Try to find a movie to watch, you scroll forever. Trying to find something to listen to, you scroll through Spotify forever. I want somebody to just have a, a shelf of mood playlists for day, night, taking your shoes off, making pasta, <laughs> you know, all of the different phases of my motley life, my wild mm -hmm. and wondrous life. I want, I want uh, Zara to be there making playlists for them. You're so right, though, about the sort of paralysis of mm -hmm. having so many options. There's something oddly comforting about going into like a dive bar and they just have a regular old jukebox yeah. and there's 
Like you look through and you go, there are like only three half decent songs on this whole thing, but that's great because you know what you have to work with. I once got kicked out of a bar for playing Take This Job and Shove It three times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What's uh, something else that uh, our listeners are the master of? Phil is the master of being behind trucks that have something fall off of them. A case oh, no. of potato chips, cedar shingles, the entire roof of the truck, and once, memorably, a porta john. No. <laughs> Poor Phil. <laughs> uh, that would uh, that would actually strike some panic in me next time I was be like if you've got that kind of luck. What happens when a porta john hits the freeway at 60 miles an hour? I assume nothing good. <laughs> Okay, one more thing that one of our listeners is a master of. Okay, how about this one from Heather? Heather says, I am a master at remembering my dreams, which happen to be very vivid. Are you a dream rememberer? No, I, I, I rarely remember anything from my dreams. Um, and when I do, it's, it's sort of complete nonsense. But I'm jealous of people that have these sort of coherent dreams that they remember the characters and what people were doing and stuff. I mean, it's like a fun, free movie you get to stream into your brain. Yeah. I have a theory that nonfiction writers don't remember their dreams and fiction writers and poets do quite a bit and they talk about it quite a bit. So uh, <laughs> who's with me, nonfiction writers? <laughs> All right. Thank you to everyone for sending in your responses. We've got another listener question for next week's show coming up at the end of today's program. In the meantime... Our next guest has amassed a following of over a quarter million folks across her various social media feeds, but she wants you to know that that fame has not changed her one bit, other than the fact that she's touring the country with her hour-long stand-up comedy tour titled How to Embarrass Your Immigrant Parents. Other than that, she is exactly, exactly like the rest of us. This is Abby Govindin here on Livewire. Oh my God. Thank you guys for coming. Um, my name is Abby Govindan. I know that I don't look like my name is Abby, and it's because my name is not short for Abigail, it's short for something in Sanskrit. That's not the joke, not yet. <laughs> so, my full name is Abhinaya Govindan. Translated from Sanskrit, Govindan means shepherd, and Abhinaya means over dramatic. <laughs> my name does mean over dramatic shepherd. So essentially, I am Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> I am currently touring uh, the country with my hour called How to Embarrass Your Immigrant Parents. It is the story of how I told my parents I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. They were very, very upset about it. Uh, we had a terrible relationship for a long time, and we worked past it together, and now we have a really great relationship. So I talk about my parents a lot uh, over the course of my stand-up hour, and one question that I get really often, if you'll believe it, people will come up to me after the show, and they'll say, hey, Abby, why don't you use an Indian accent when you're talking about your parents? And it's like racism of that question aside, I feel like my parents' Indian accent is like the least funny thing about them, you know? Like my dad, he's a very stoic, unemotional Indian man. I have never seen this man shed a tear once, except for the day Steve Jobs died randomly. <laughs> My mom's a different kind of funny. She's where I get my sense of humor from. When I was a kid, if I ever upset her, she would say, hey, Abby, you know you're adopted, right? <laughs> and I'd be like, no, Amma, that can't be the case because I look exactly like you. And she was like, yeah, you know how after a while dogs start looking like their owners? <laughs> That's kind of what's happening here. <laughs> A lot of Indian stand-up comedians, they like to come up on stage, they like to say, I disappointed my parents by becoming a stand-up comedian. That's not actually necessarily the case for me. Stand-up comedy is going pretty well. I'm a seasoned vet in embarrassing my parents in that I was doing it well before I was a stand-up comedian. You know what I'm saying? In my senior year, I took a class called The Psychology of Disgust. And each week, we would talk about something that was quote-unquote disgusting. And one week, our topic was white supremacy. Right? And so our professors informed us that we had to buy the Klansmen to study it that week. Now, the Klansmen, for those of you who don't know, is uh, the KKK manifesto, kind of like the handbook on how to be racist. Now, uh, there are two places that you can get the Klansmen. The first is the KKK, and the second is the University of Arkansas. <laughs> 
Now here is the problem. Uh, the KKK's version was a little bit cheaper. <laughs> Have you ever been so broke you find yourself questioning your racial morals? No, so I emailed the University of Arkansas and I was like, hey, I'm a broke college student, I can't afford this, would you be able to send it to me for free? And they responded, the lady was really nice, she was like, no, I'm sorry, the proceeds from this go to our history and classics department, you would have to pay for it. So I emailed the KKK. <laughs> I feel like you guys are having a little bit of trouble trusting me. <laughs> Do you guys want to hear that email? I said, dear KKK HR department. <laughs> my name is Abby Gail, and I'm a nice white woman from the University of Arkansas. I've considered dabbling in white supremacy, but have very little money because of Obama. <laughs> Would you kindly send me a copy of the Klansman free of charge? Yours, Abigail. And a few weeks later, I got a response. It said, Dearest Abigail, it is so nice to see young women such as yourself proactively engaging with their heritage. Attached, you will find a full copy of The Klansman, free of charge. Yours, the KKK. <laughs> and that is the story of the time I was so broke that I scammed the KKK out of $32. <laughs> Um, I did move to New York City around this time last year, actually, to pursue stand-up comedy full-time. So happy to be there. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I love living in New York City. I love doing this. I love traveling and making people laugh for a living. But moving out of my house was so painful. I had grown so close to my parents over the course of the pandemic. My mom dropped me off at the airport. I was a mess. I was sobbing. I was like, Amma, I'm going to miss you so much. And she, without missing a beat, looks me straight in the eye and says, Abby, will you please stop crying at the airport? People are going to think we're human trafficking you. <laughs> You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much. Keep it going for your host. Abby Govindan, everybody, right here on LiveWire. That was Abby Govindan right here on LiveWire. You can follow Abby along with her many, many other followers over on Instagram at Abby Govindan or on Twitter at Abby G-O-V. And you can find out more information about her stand-up show, How to Embarrass Your Immigrant Parents, over on those places as well. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarella. We've got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, our musical guest, Reckless Son, will talk about what it's like performing to incarcerated folks in prisons all over the country. Plus, we're going to hear a song from him in a moment right after this quick break. Welcome back to LiveWire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Okay, before we get our musical guest dialed up, a little preview of next week's show. We are going to be talking to Michelle Zahner. You may know Michelle Zahner as the musician Japanese Breakfast. Of course, she also released a very highly acclaimed memoir called Crying in H Mart, which talks about food and her late mother and how she and her mother connected over cooking. Then we're going to get some stand-up from the very funny Sean Patton about the perils of air travel and also his uh, personal campaign to normalize uh, public flatulence. Um, and then <laughs> we're going to hear some music from one of my very favorite folks out there right now. Kurt Vile is going to be checking in. Uh, and as always, we're going to be looking to get your answer to our listener question. Elena, what are we asking the listeners for next week's show? We want to know, what would you like to normalize? So what practice, behavior, hobby? All right. If you have an answer to that question, what would you like to normalize? Hit us up on Twitter or Facebook. We're at Livewire Radio. This is Livewire from PRX. Our musical guest this week has performed over 150 concerts in jails and prisons across the country from Utah to Rikers Island. He's turned those experiences into a one-man show titled Reckless Son, featuring a collection of music and monologues painting vivid pictures of the people that he's met and the stories he's heard from inside those facilities. His self-titled debut album comes out in June. Let's welcome Reckless Son to Livewire. Wow. 
Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. We're happy to have you here. I've been following your journey online, and I find it totally fascinating. I kind of wanted to start at the beginning. Like, what was the moment that you, you sort of had the idea, hey, maybe I should go and actually play for incarcerated folks? At the time when I played my first concert in a jail, which was in 2016, I was working on music for a documentary film about teenagers that were struggling with substance use and uh, special recovery high schools that were created in order to support them. Um, And while I was working on that film, I saw a video on Facebook of men inside of a heroin recovery program in a county jail in Virginia singing. And it occurred to me that they might appreciate or relate to some of the music that I was writing. And very quickly, um, a concert got arranged for me at what's called the SHARP unit, the Sheriff's Heroin Addiction Recovery Program in the Albany County Jail, which is, you know, in the capital region of New York. And uh, I just went up and played. And what was that like right before you strike your first chord on the guitar as you're looking around to this room of, of folks that are incarcerated. Like, what's going through your mind? Is your heart racing? It's racing a little bit right now, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, you know, in all seriousness. Yeah. Well, yeah, for sure, yeah, without, without a doubt. But then, you know, you're now in an area where, again, people are being incarcerated. Um, they are going through whatever they're going through. And now you very earnestly with this instrument are going to like speak your story to them. How did they take it? You know, the way it went over surprised everybody. I think it surprised them. It surprised me. I think there was there was a huge amount of skepticism, you know, when they saw me walk in with a guitar and was kind of like, what is (laughs) what was this guy about? What's what's he here for? Um, I think the sheriff was really surprised you know, (laughs) as far as how it went over. (laughs) But um, something I didn't think about when I first went in to do it was that when you walk in to to provide a service, a volunteer service at a correctional facility, you automatically gain a little bit of credibility with those folks because they understand to some degree that you've you've taken time to come and and give it to them. Mm -hmm. Um, As my experience would would lead me to believe that, you know, people who are incarcerated have a tendency to feel uh, unseen or or mm-hmm. neglected or out of sight and out of mind. And so I think that right off the bat, before I played my first song, there was some degree of appreciation that existed just because I was willing to come and, and spend time with them. And I understand that you've actually visited a number of facilities here in Oregon since you've been here. Three. Yeah. How long have you been here? How long have we been here? Tuesday. So, so like, yeah, yeah. So, so like yeah. you're averaging one prison a day? Uh, one and a half. <laughs> I visited uh, OSP, Oregon State Penitentiary, yesterday morning, and um, one of the most remarkable things I've seen in my whole life is that in that facility they have a Japanese healing garden set up with uh, a koi pond, if you could believe it. Um, We were given a tour by a man named Randy who had done like 30, 33 years in solitary confinement on on death row, and... uh, the thing that was so striking about it, I mean, it was a lot to take in, you know, in, in general, but there's probably no place more appropriate for a Japanese healing garden to be yeah. than a maximum security prison. But at the same time, that's probably the least likely place you'd ever think to find one. And so if I were going to make a comment about the carceral system, that would be it as far yeah. as just sort of like, are we intending for people to, to heal while they're in there? But uh, the idea that it was so unlikely for that to be there, but that there was no other place that it, that it should be, you know, yeah. really, really, really struck me. Do you ever find yourself playing a gig for the non-incarcerated thinking, I wish I was at Rikers? <laughs> <laughs> like, man, this coffee shop, mm, these people are stiffs. <laughs> well, I will say that uh, I do tend to be more comfortable playing for the incarcerated than I do uh, for, a, for a civilian audience. Well, speaking of which, what song are we going to hear? Uh, it's a song called The Wisdom of a Child. I wrote it for my little brother, James. This is Reckless Son on Livewire. On deck aboard a pilot boat, we awaited for the light. Auto 
Cause we warmed our hands Breathing fog into the night Through ancient ways of navigation Following a star Brother, I can't tell you where you're going But I know just where you are Every time I close my eyes I sink into a sleep I stare across the sky I hear the sound of your heartbeat I see the man that you become Following a dream, dream, dream Skate across the ocean like a figure on the ice the Waves will come crashing down Like tumbling dice We place no faith in destinations Be they near or far oh, Brother, I can't tell you where you're going But I know just who you are As you've grown up tall Humble in your rising And gracious in a fall You'll see the world, you'll see it all As the man that you become In service of a call Just listen for your call the sea, but your hand will trace the state of grace, a map from up above, cause brother I can tell that where you're going, you're bringing light and bringing love, so I follow as you light my way, with the wisdom of a child. That was Reckless Son, right here on Livewire. His self-titled EP is out in June. That's going to do it for this episode of Livewire. Big thanks to our guests, Adam Gopnik, Abby Govindin, and Reckless Son. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sepchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. Our marketing and production manager is Paige Thomas. Our production fellow is Tanvi Kumar. And Yasmin Median is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer, and our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Additional funding provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. This week, we'd like to thank member Katrina Penafleur of Portland, Oregon. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week.
Dear Livewire, when we first met, I was really shy. I had no idea we'd spend so much time together or that you'd be one to fill my heart with, with joy and make me want to be a better person. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. I was busy reading a review from one of our many, many rapturously smitten listeners. Oh, wait, actually, no, sorry. This is from Elena. Anyway, the point is, uh, it would be really helpful if you wanted to leave us a review. Feel free to say really nice things about us, and uh, we'll even read them now and then on the show. So you might hear your review of Livewire read on the program itself. Uh, Reviews help other people hear about the show, and then we can keep doing this for a long, long time because we love having this job. Uh, Thank you so much if you've left a review, and if you're about to leave a review, you can go ahead and do it right where you get the podcast.